For more than 200 years, beginning in the 17th century, Japan virtually closed its doors to the rest of the world. This self-imposed exile from 1638 to 1854 was an effort to protect the country's feudal and value systems from the influence of foreigners. In essence, daimyo, feudal lords, were overseers of samurai, the military class, who in turn ruled over vassal peasants. This rigid class system created a culture of unquestioning loyalty, a strong sense of group identity, and a willingness to follow prescribed behavioral rules or ethics. Shushin. By the late 1800s, the new Meiji regime had replaced the feudal system with a Western-style government and industrial society that needed capital to affect change. Heavy government taxes on peasant farmers, poor harvests, and famine motivated overseas migration. Stories in Japanese newspapers forecast that money could be literally scooped from the ground. The Issei, first-generation Japanese immigrants, were attracted to America by lofty dreams of quick wealth. Issei debarking on the U.S. West Coast sought jobs primarily as laborers in agriculture, fishing, sawmills, and railroads. They envisioned working diligently and earning enough money to return to Japan and lead stable lives. The Japanese population in this country increased from just over 2,000 in 1890 to more than 24,000 10 years later. In Oregon alone, their numbers grew from 25 to 2,501 in the same period. Issei, who encountered Oregon's lush Hood River Valley, just 10 miles wide and 26 miles long, saw scenic reminders of their native Japan, as well as a developing economy based on logging and orchards. Separated by rough valley terrain, poor roads, and language and culture barriers, the Issei mostly lived in outlying communities, Parkdale, D, Odell, Pine Grove, and Oak Grove. By 1910, the Japanese population of the Hood River Valley was the largest in Oregon outside Portland. In the early 20th century, immigrants specifically Asians, were sought as a source of cheap labor. Despite low wages and the time-consuming and strenuous work, the frugal Issei began to purchase or trade for small tracts of uncleared timber or swamp or brush land. They also sometimes received stump land as incentives for clearing land, labor that others shunned. Gradually, the Issei transformed this marginal land into productive farms, growing asparagus, strawberries, and other fruit. By 1920, about 70 Japanese farmers owned 1,200 acres, on average, more than 17 acres per farm. Japanese farmers also joined the local Apple Growers Association. In downtown Hood River, the Yasui Brothers store at First and Oak Streets featured both Eastern and Western stock. The store proprietor, Masuo Yasui, acted as a liaison between Caucasians and Japanese. Ominously, as Issei orchards were beginning to mature and become productive, local and state anti-Japanese sentiments also began to escalate. In a surprise attack at dawn on Sunday, December 7, 1941, Japanese forces bombed U.S. ships and planes at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. More than 3,500 Americans were killed or wounded, and seven U.S. battleships were either sunk or damaged. The next day, the United States declared war on Japan. No matter how long it may take us, to overcome this premeditated invasion, the American people in their righteous might will win through to absolute victory.
For the Issei, a nightmare was about to begin. Within a few hours of the bombing, the government branded them enemy aliens. Along the Pacific coast, agents of the FBI began rounding up Issei community leaders. Decades later, there's accumulating evidence that some in the U.S. government and military were not surprised by the attack on Pearl Harbor. So it's not surprising that the declaration of war was used by profiteers to fan the flames of anti-immigrant sentiment. During most of the 20th century and before, racism in the United States was largely unrecognized simply because it was inherent in the social systems and cultural divisions of the era. Many Issei and their children, the second generation Nisei, who were in fact American citizens, were no longer welcomed as neighbors or colleagues. After Pearl Harbor, sensational and inaccurate reports continued to circulate about Japanese agents and sympathizers. Oregon Governor Charles A. Sprague boycotted committee hearings that examined the problems of evacuation. FBI agents began arriving in Hood River, searching selected Issei homes and confiscating firearms, radios, cameras, and anything that looked suspicious. Such actions had long been planned by top federal officials. Five months before Pearl Harbor, a special Department of Justice committee, with assistance from the FBI and the Office of Naval Intelligence, was busy preparing lists of Japanese and German immigrants with something in their record showing an allegiance to the enemy. The so-called ABC list, which numbered 2,000 by mid-1941, included known dangerous aliens whom the FBI had individually investigated. They were the A-list. Others about whom the government had suspicions were on the B-list. And hundreds of men with clean records who had never been investigated, but whose position or occupation made them suspicious, formed the C-list. During the week after Pearl Harbor, more than a thousand Issei men were arrested up and down the West Coast. The FBI singled out community leaders, religious leaders, and educators. They arrested businessmen, officers in Japanese associations, editors of Japanese language newspapers, Shinto and Buddhist priests, and teachers in Japanese language schools. And on December 12, 1941, they came for Masuo Yasui. There were no charges. The family was not told where he would be taken. Each day brought the increasing likelihood that Issei and Nisei would be forcibly removed. Consumed by panic and goaded by the rumor mill, they became victims of opportunists who purchased or leased their property at a fraction of its value. By the end of January 1942, congressmen from the Pacific Coast urged President Franklin D. Roosevelt to give the War Department control over enemy aliens, and they encouraged him to authorize evacuation, resettlement, or internment. On February 19, 1942, Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, authorizing the designation of military areas from which any or all persons may be excluded. At this point, Japanese were encouraged to move voluntarily out of the prohibited and restricted areas. However, officials soon decided the voluntary evacuation was not working or was not safe enough. On March 27, Issei and Nisei were barred from moving. At noon on May 7, Civil Exclusion Order No. 49 was posted in Hood River. In six days, not only the Issei, but also the Nisei would be evacuated. In Hood River, 
60 soldiers camped at the Legion Hall in preparation for the evacuation. Weighted down with duffel bags and suitcases, 431 Issei and Nisei departed from the Hood River train station at 10 a.m. Residents of Hood River, Wasco, and part of Sherman County departed by train to Pinedale, California. In the next six months, approximately 122,000 men, women, and children were evacuated to and confined in isolated, fenced, and guarded incarceration camps. The government referred to them as relocation centers. The 10 sites were located in remote areas in six western states and Arkansas, Hart Mountain in Wyoming, Tule Lake and Manzanar in California, Topaz in Utah, Poston and Gila River in Arizona, Granada in Colorado, Minidoka in Idaho, and Jerome and Rower in Arkansas. Finally permitted to return home in 1945, Issei and Nisei from Hood River were met by a community campaign discouraging their return. Local sentiment had so intensified that names of Japanese American servicemen who had fought with U.S. forces in World War II were removed from a downtown county war memorial. This brought nationwide censure to the valley. At the same time, a mostly unheralded group of valley residents organized to offer support and counteract propaganda. Only 186 out of 462 pre-war Issei and Nisei returned to the Hood River Valley. Nationwide, nearly 70,000 Nisei, all American citizens, were incarcerated. The government had made no charges against them, nor could they appeal their incarceration. All lost personal liberties, and most lost homes and property as well. Although several Japanese Americans challenged the government's actions in court cases, the Supreme Court upheld their legality. Nisei had nevertheless been encouraged to serve in the armed forces, and some had been drafted. Altogether, more than 20,000 Japanese Americans served with distinction during World War II. Some served as linguists in the South Pacific. Others fought in Europe with the 100th Battalion and 442nd Regimental Combat Team. For many years after the war, various individuals and groups sought compensation for those who had been incarcerated. Many homeowners and businessmen had been forced to sell out quickly. Their total property loss is estimated at $1.3 billion, with a net income loss of $2.7 billion, and that's calculated in 1983 dollars. The Japanese American Evacuation Claims Act of 1948 provided token payments for some property losses. More serious efforts to make amends took place in the early 1980s when the Commission on Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilians held investigations based on their recommendations in 1988. Public Law 100-383 was passed, acknowledging the injustice of the incarceration, apologizing for it, and providing restitution. Hood River East Say persisted in the face of financial hardships and racial persecution. In their pioneering efforts, Issei leave a legacy of courage, dedication, sacrifice, and honor. Their story is one that exemplifies the most basic values and dreams of our country's founders. We can be proud of and must do our utmost to safeguard this promise for our future. <laughs>